Curious Droid. Hello and welcome to another edition of Curious Droid Live. Um, now, this week we're actually going to be... Oh. Excuse me a moment, I'm just hearing something... It. Sorry, I had my <laughs> I had my YouTube um, working on there, so I could hear myself going through twice. Didn't realise that at the time. So anyway, as I was saying, this week we're actually dealing with USOs or underwater uh, uh, submerged. Uh, what am I talking about? Uh, unidentified submerged Unknown. objects. That's it. Yes, uh, unidentified submerged objects, which a lot of people will say is like the UFO <laughs> version. Um, but underwater. But what we're looking at here is things which are happening which are not necessarily the same as what you would see in the sky because obviously you can't see under the water. These have been detected by um, sonar and other electronic means in the fairly recent past, really in the Cold War. So that's the sort of area we're going to be looking at there. Now, I've got uh, our guest with us today, which is Mark D'Antonio, um, our uh, astronomer, photo, video uh, analyst, talking head expert to science channels like the Discovery Channel and um, What on Earth uh, on the science, ch science channels there. Also host of a Sky Tour radio at KGRA and CEO of FX Models. Now, FX Models is a US Navy contractor. So now Mark actually has, if I bring him in. Um, uh, Hi there. <laughs> Hi, Mark. <laughs> uh, um, Mark has actually witnessed one of the USOs. Um, and now I bring this bit in about them being a, a US Navy contractor because he was actually on a nuclear submarine. Um, and that's how he came to actually sort of be in this position. And to be honest, I'd never heard of um, a USO until about three weeks ago when I was talking to Mark. So if you can sort of bring us up to speed on how you actually... Um, ended up on the submarine and what you were actually sort of you saw and experienced there well sure and, and thank you paul i mean and, and hello everybody who's listening and watching uh i have to say you know i'm a science guy so this stuff doesn't happen to me until it does then I've, i'm left to figure out what to do with it and pick up the pieces so I, i'm i'm in a position where i'm just as much dumbfounded by uh this event as as other people are and have been but i'm a navy contractor i do navy work yes and i build submarine models primarily and that's our specialty uh we pride ourselves on our understanding of underwater realm uh as an astronomer that's what i got my degree in as an astronomer i would basically uh just change the sign on the pressure equation essentially to do stuff underwater versus up in space so you know in space you hold the walls in 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 the ocean you push the walls out to keep the pressure out uh, from the ocean. So uh, I was doing work for the Navy and uh, it's, it's sort of as a thank you, they said, hey, do you want to go on a ride? I went, a ride in, in what, a car, a plane, where? where? And they said, a submarine. I was like, what? Wow, what a great idea, I'd love to. So I went on this ride in a submarine and uh, it, was, uh, it was the most fun I had being seasick, frankly, uh, because on the surface, okay, it, it's round, okay, the hull of a sub is round, so on the surface it's rolling a little bit, okay, not a whole lot, but it's rolling a little bit, and once you get underneath, it's it's rock steady, all right, and the only, and then when it turns, it banks in the turns, okay, it does like this, now when it banks in the turns, you actually feel a little bit heavier, and that's how you know you're turning, that's the only giveaway, uh, you don't feel the turn, because you're it's banking with you, and of course, you're standing straight up and, and it keeps the center of gravity just so that it, it's on, it goes right down through the center of your body. So you feel this being a little heavier and you say, oh, we're turning, <laughs> you know. But um, so, but while on the surface, th this rolling action uh, did me in, you know, because you know, I, I couldn't just go to the window and look out. <laughs> Subs don't no have windows. windows. No. Right. But what I did do is I climbed a little tiny ladder all the way up to the top of the sail 
And there I was hanging over the edge going like, oh, please don't get sick. Please don't get sick. You know, looking out over the horizon saying, okay, they say stare at the horizon, stare at the horizon when, uh, when we were surfaced. But then they, when we had to go under, then it was a matter of now I had to climb back down the 18 feet to the control room down below. And now I'm surrounded by just machinery and so forth. So anyway, um, I was trying to get over my seasickness by sitting in the sonar section. And the sonar side is the control room is here. Okay, and off to the right side is a little tiny aisle, and that aisle is where the sonars are. So I was sitting at one of the sonars that was active, but, but you know, I, there was nobody manning it. There was a kid next to me on the right, and he was manning his sonar. And basically, uh, I was trying to just zone out and get rid of my seasickness. And I was feeling much better, actually. It was helping me. And all of a sudden, I'm jolted awake by the kid uh, calling the con, the, the command, and said, con sonar, con sonar, fast mover fast mover. And I woke up thinking, what, what, what the heck? We're going to be killed. We're going to die. I'm, I'm going to die out here by a torpedo or something. Because to me, I was thinking fast mover meant torpedo. And the executive officer comes around and he sits over the kid's shoulder and says, what do you got? And I think, I mean, it's loud on a sub, so you got to keep in mind, it's loud. It's not, it's not like it's very quiet. They always make it sound like, oh, it's very quiet. Yeah, from the outside. But inside, you've got high pressure air, you've got noise, you've got people talking, you've got machinery. But the Navy prides itself in that sound not getting out. So anyway, um, I couldn't hear everything he said, the, the bearing, the range, you know, you know, where it was basically. Uh, but when it came to the speed, I leaned forward on the edge of my seat, which was locked down to the floor. And, uh, I had just a tiny little bit of my butt on the seat cause I was way over just trying to listen in. And when the kid told him how fast it was moving, I think all three of us were dumbfounded. Um, me by eavesdropping and the other two by, you know, the kid never saw something like this before, but the XO, I think, had. And because uh, the kid said, and when the XO asked, how fast is it moving? And the kid said, several hundred knots, sir. And the executive officer just said, okay, log it and dog it. And right. it's almost, he was almost. He was almost relieved, Paul. You know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, I, don't know, I don't know what that meant. Uh, I think maybe I, I was reading into it. I didn't know at the time. So anyway, uh, I got up and I went over to the executive officer because after all, hey, I was invited to be on this sub. I was a big, important person, right? I walked over to the executive officer and he said, XO, I know what these fast mover things are. Maybe I can help you. And he put his hand on my shoulder and said, Mr. D'Antonio, are you having a good time so far? Yes, sir, I am. Let's keep it that way. And he walked away. Okay. <laughs> I just shrunk down. I was like, okay, I'll just hide over here in the corner. Thank you. You know, it's like, you know, embarrassing. Um, and so I, I kind of learned that even by invitation, you can't get to see everything, even if you have the right clearance, you know, which I did. But it's only a need to know thing. So anyway, uh, a couple of years later, I had to do a job for a very powerful group in Washington, the, the Joint Chiefs of Staff. They advised the President of the United States. And when I, uh, did the project, I had to deliver it. And I delivered it to uh, one of the members who it turned out to become a friend. And I asked him in the privacy of his own home, what can you tell me about this fast mover program? And he looked at me and he goes, I can't talk about that program, Mark, I'm sorry. He could have said, what program? I, I never heard of that. He didn't. And I was just stunned. So he basically said nothing but said everything. So there, that's, so that's the story. And, and that's, you know, you can't make this stuff up. You know, you just, it, and the story is the same as I've told it, you know, a few years now. And the only reason I told it at all uh, without any kind of fear is because the, the Russians have come out and said this, you know, and, and as you'll see, as, as, as you're going to talk about, Paul, you know, other navies have also uh, experienced these unknown submerged objects as well. Yes, I think um, obviously the Russian um, has, uh, has, they've tried to sort of um, discredit anybody that's come out and said anything about this and said, oh no, it's just something you've, you've imagined or whatever. Or they've actually probably maybe even said, yeah, it might, be, it might be aliens or whatever. Because obviously if they've got things to hide, bearing in mind that they've got... Um, military technology they've got testing they're creeping around following the americans um yeah. they're, they're doing all sorts of various things which obviously we are not privy to and we can right. guess um so th having the alien side of it can actually be very useful for trying to sort of <laughs> muddy the waters and i mean we've seen 
this sort of thing happened in the last couple of weeks with first yeah. the um, uh, incident in Salisbury um, with this amazing backwards and forwards uh, to and fro between the British and the, the, the Russian government, basically both saying they're each other are liars, and then almost saying, well, you've made it up. Um, we think you're doing this, we do that. And you, you think, I can't believe what they're saying almost. But it serves mm. a purpose to really muddy the waters, and the same with in, in Syria at the moment. It's doing the same thing. Uh, so you can see how they could sort of use the, uh, the alien connotation to it uh, to try and muddy the waters considerably there and hide yeah. what they're up to um, on that side. And I think um, it's been noted by the Norwegian Navy. I haven't seen anything out of the Royal Navy, which is unusual, but then again, they might be a bit more tight-lipped about it. But the, yeah. the, the US um, hasn't sort of said a great deal either, unless obviously uh, you, you know slightly better than I do. Well, only slightly. I mean, I, I haven't been able to you know, really get anything out of anybody other than an admission that there is some program to log things we don't understand underwater. Yeah. And uh, yeah. that's why with Douglas Trumbull, the famous Academy Award winning uh, you know, visual effects guy, um, I'm working with Doug to create this uh, UFO hunting system. And there's one for looking up in the air that we're designing. And then there's one that's going to be a floating unit that looks down in the ocean. That's our USO hunter. And I think that's going to be uh, a really interesting uh, you know, system once we get it up and running fully. Uh, it, it's not it's not up yet, um, and we're still working on it, but, you know, these things are there. It, this, this stuff is happening. There's something going on. Let's put it that way. Now, what could it have been? Could it have been a really speedy whale? No, not several hundred <laughs> knots. Could it have been some kind of uh, other... Uh, U, uh, U.S. or Russian or other Navy uh, vehicle underwater, you know, that, that, of any large size? No. Could it have been a weapon under testing? Well, not at the time, hmm. okay? And and you're going to mention some things about weapons as yes, well yes. on the line here, which I think we're going to kind of dive into that, no pun intended. Well, yeah, I did. That was a <laughs> uh, uh, you know, But you get my point. So I, I think that the topic is wide open, and I think that a lot of people want to know what's going on, and, and so do I. Uh, and once the Russians came out and said it, Paul, I was able, to, I felt more comfortable talking about what happened. Yeah, you felt safe, so you didn't feel like you were you were the only one talking about it. I was not the say, only voice in the forest. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they'd say, oh, well, your U.S. Navy contractors uh, might be sort of up for renewal and it might not get renewed, <laughs> that yeah. sort of thing, yeah. Uh, put the, put the, um, the pressure on um, to obviously keep you quiet if necessary. Uh, yeah, there. but but I decided so, I, mean, I don't. I, I decided I don't care about that though. I decided I don't. I don't. I don't have a problem with that because I think the truth is more important, frankly. And I mean, I did not mean to interrupt you there. Sorry, but uh, no, it's no, it's fine, fine. Yeah. All right. So, so I mean, we're talking about things which are moving fast. So this is yeah. normally faster than we can move through the water itself. I think a normal naval torpedoes can go up to about 50 knots, which is about 70, 80 kilometres an hour, something like that. And we're talking several hundred kilometres an hour. But this is something which has been going on. I mean, obviously, there are reports that go back a long time. So uh, I think you were saying that the oldest sort of report, this you can't actually call it a report, but story yeah, goes possible. back a yeah, long, right. long, 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 long time ago. Yeah, and I talk about this when I lecture around the country because when I, I talk about uh, this one incident, there, there's a there's a region of Australia where uh, uh, an Aboriginal culture uh, lives, still lives, and the the story was that there were these gods that came from the sky, lived in the water, uh, underwater, and had full mastery of the water. Now they call them the Wanjina, and that's W A N D J I N A, Wanjina. Okay, or the Wanjina, depending on you know what side you're from, um, and the Wanjina theory goes. The, the, the myth says that uh, two boys tortured an owl to death, and in retribution, the Wanjina destroyed the Aboriginal camp using their mastery of the water. Uh, and it's just a myth, but you know the point is owls have long been uh, you know considered screen memory cover for people that have seen alien beings. Now I'm, I'm not a, I'm not a big 
abduction guy, although I feel I had some experiences like that, but what do I know? You know, uh, the truth will come out someday, but the Wanjana, that myth goes back 5,000 years to the Kimberley region of Australia. And maybe this is telling us this was a USO, and that is beings lived under the water. They said they came from the sky and lived under the water. Yeah, that's so key. Again, yeah, again, again, we're coming back into this something coming from the sky going into the water. But obviously, then, <coughs> excuse me, this, this ability to move extremely quickly. So, I mean, we've got things uh, which have been documented, but we, with a hit, with, I say, it's all. Um, hearsay there was no real sort of evidence as such whereas nowadays we've actually got electronic measuring systems we've got something that says right we can measure an object traveling extremely quickly from one place to another now um obviously the nearest thing we've got to doing this at the moment are the uh cavitate super cavitation uh torpedoes and the skival is the russian one uh, that was developed in the Soviet Union back in the 60s, and I think it went into operation in 77. And yeah. that that uses um, a rocket engine to actually uh, force its way through the, rocket, uh, the water. Now, you'd say, well, yeah. how would you use a rocket engine underwater for, and how does it work? Well, that's simple. That, that's, it needs, what it does is um, it, it fires a rocket backwards, but it also uses the thrust of a rocket to fire forwards, through a, a small disc at the front. The disc is flat, so it starts a cavitation process. Then the exhaust, part of the exhaust of a rocket comes in and then creates effectively a steam bubble which goes forward and then back around the actual uh, torpedo itself. That's right, the yeah. The torpedo itself then is encased in a bubble of steam. It's not actually in contact with the water because the hydrodynamic forces just physically wouldn't allow you to go that fast. Um, but by using a bubble of steam around it and yet uh, with four fins which stick out and those just pierce this bubble and by uh, moving the fins in and out of the bubble of steam, that's how they guide the missile around. But it can't go very quickly one way or the other because it will break out of its steam bubble and then it'll probably just break up because it'll be like hitting a brick wall, hitting water at uh, what's it, 370 kilometres an hour at 200 uh, knots. I, I think you're right. I think you're um, right about that, yeah. That, if, 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 if that. Plus also you were saying that these things are incredibly noisy because you've got a rocket engine underwater creating this cavitation bubble with steam. So they're the noisiest things for probably hundreds of miles around. That obviously gives their position away. Um, yeah, it's, it's a last ditch. It's a desperation last, yeah. measure. Sorry. Yeah. 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 They've only got a range of about seven kilometers. So the, the submarine that launches it has to get very close to uh, the, the ship it's going to try and hit. And because they can't target the thing with sonar, because it's so loud, they couldn't hear the sonar pulse is coming back because of all the racket, the, 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 the cavitation and the rocket motors are, are actually creating. So they just sort of, sort of aim it, fire it, and that's it, off it goes. Now, that is something which has got that speed, but it creates too much of a noise. Um, and I think you were saying that when they were, tr when you were in the, the, the nuclear sub, when they were tracking it, they didn't hear, they say it made a lot of noise. No, as a matter of fact, it made a very, very small trace. Uh, it was only, uh, and, and actually, you make a good point because I forgot to mention this. It's a very, it was a very fine line developing on the on the sonar, all right. And the the thing is, it, it as it was moving, uh, the when the executive officer said uh, he came around, he said, "Well, how fast is it moving?" Listed that and the other, you know, several hundred knots, not seven hundred, several hundred knots. Okay, um, the the, the XO then asked, uh, you know, can you confirm this? And there was another sonar next to me that was actually for a different, separate, totally separate sonar. There's there's several different sonars on the sub, okay? Never mind active and passive. That's not this, but there were several types of passive sonar on, on board the sub. And he actually looked at uh, another one that was next to me, and it was there too. I didn't see it because I didn't know how to read a sonar, 
But he says, yeah, it's confirmed, sir. You know, and then the XO, XO then said, okay, log it and dog it. And that's the thing that, you know, really made the difference is when, when you say that. Now you know, okay, this is something. He This XO knew what he was looking at or at least knew what he was not looking at. Most more likely, you know, he was not looking at a Russian thing. He was not looking at a Chinese thing. He was not looking at anything that could threaten us that we know of. And these things are out there. They don't know what to do with them. So they track them and they put them into this log and they, they hide the log. They give it to the uh, program uh, leads down in Washington, D.C. when they get back, basically. That's my take on it anyway. Yeah. And basically, they've been disappearing to um, the depths of the archives to be either brought yeah. out many, many years later or just forgotten about altogether, hopefully. Right, right by, you know, out on that, you know, Indiana Jones warehouse, <laughs> <Yeah>. okay, <laughs> where they stick the Ark of the Covenant, it's in there, and it's, a, it's, it's on top of that box that the Ark's in or something, you know. <laughs> <laughs> that massive run down there, yeah. yeah. So, out, so yeah. I mean, we, so we've had the, the, the Scrival, and we know that the other countries have been developing similar things, but they tend to be a copy of that. So... The right. technology which um, I read about what they were advancing on wasn't making the things quieter. It was actually giving them slightly more in the way of guidance so they could turn more and also almost like having noise cancellation systems on them. So it would yeah. cancel out the noise of their own engines and the cavitation yeah. bubble around it. So then they could use a sonar system of some description to try and find its target but that obviously doesn't then tie in with a lot of these um observations and sightings and recordings of what's been going on so i mean i think that one of the most common or most well-known ones is the the shag harbor incident and again uh, i think you obviously know a bit more about that than me well the, the shag harbor incident um and we, we both are probably equally versed on this one because, uh, it, to be frank, uh, I focus right now on getting our systems to look at UFOs in the sky done. Once I get that done, then we're going to talk about USOs and start digging into that. Um, and it's going to be another passive floater that goes below the surface of the ocean. Okay. And I'm sure that the chat's going to have fun with the word floater. Okay. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> but uh, it's going to basically bob up and down on its tether. And by going up and down on the tether, it's going to charge its battery. That, that's yeah. that a little charging system by that that thing but uh and that, that's using the ocean to our advantage right so um <clears throat> that said as far as the the underwater usos go uh you know, there's still a lot of mystery here because if these are ufos from the sky that transition to running underwater well certain things have to change you can't use the same well maybe you can okay depending on how you're flying these things if you're actually interdimensional which until string theory came around, we don't really talk about interdimensional, but, uh, but different string theory uh, ideas have different numbers of dimensions, okay? And so maybe we're talking about a, a dimensional shift uh, that may be within or outside that realm. I don't know. Uh, but we only know what we know and the science that we know, and there's a lot that we don't know. So I can't really tell you uh, anything more about shag versus any other sighting, but I do know that it was tracked, you, you, and you know this, you said this earlier before we went on the air, it was tracked for, out of Russia uh, yeah, in the air. Siberia, yeah. yeah. In the air before it actually landed. And then when it, when it came down, apparently it was tracked for 25 miles underwater. Uh, and that's the other thing that was interesting too that I heard. I don't, you know, I don't know how to, how to correlate those reports. Good luck finding them. You know, I mean, if, if it's denied, well, then it's buried. It's in a box, you know, in a warehouse, you know, in, under classification with a red red thing around it or whatever. Yeah, although so, it was, it, it, it's one of the ones which was um, most sort of witnessed and uh, it actually made the, the headlines of the, uh, the local paper there and the Royal Mounted Police yeah. were in on it. The vendor US Navy came in. Uh, there were <laughs> various people that said they'd seen um, like a yellow foam on the surface of the uh, the water, which was half a mile long, and it had a, a sort of it's a yellow glittery foam <coughs> with an oily <coughs> consistency. Now, whether that had been there all along, and people just then picked up on it because of something had happened, don't know. It's a bit like yeah. um, the sightings where people say they've seen uh, large 
moving lights <coughs> under the sea. Well, obviously, you've got things like bioluminescence, which can uh, explain part of that, uh, yeah. with uh, microorganisms, squid, um, which actually come to the surface and they create a light show. Effectively, they're trying to attract partners and mating, and that, right. that's what that's what they do. So that sort of thing can be mistaken for these, but obviously they don't move very fast, although they might move but, regularly. So but there's that, something that's a different thing. There is something to say there, though, Paul. If if you know they may not they not, they may not um, they may not move that fast uh, normally. I'm just gonna adjust here a little bit. Um, but one of the things that you, you have to consider is that if you have a large, uh, say, uh, a large number of these bioluminescent creatures all together, yeah. then just like with other things, if a bioluminescent wave starts at the right side, okay, it can travel through the entire group to the left side and look like it's moving very fast. Yes. And it could be mistaken as one object. Now, I'm not saying that's what happened at all because bioluminescent own uh, issues with being a, a USO type thing, okay? I don't think that that would be a USO, all right? Uh, and I know it could be mistaken as a USO, but I don't think that that's what uh, people saw uh, in some of these incidents. I know that bioluminescence is actually somewhat rare, uh, and usually you'll see it at sea. I saw it when I was at sea on a, a surface ship. Uh, just flying around in the ocean there, well, zipping around in the ocean. Uh, if you look where the props are, the props in the back were, were spinning and, and churning up the uh, water, and yes, you could see yes. the bioluminescent trail behind the ship for miles. Yes, okay. that would be the, uh, the, the, like the microorganism, uh, the, the bioluminescent right. plankton, and when they're yes. stirred up, then they actually that's right. create the bioluminescence. That's right. <laughs> and by the way, I just want to say that I'm glad that I could have a shirt that's a little more odd than yours today. <laughs> yeah, I, I've dressed down almost by the looks of things. I want one with short sleeves because it's really hot in here today at the moment. There's no well, air conditioning. I'm, I'm, I'm wearing short sleeves here too, so, you know, I'm, I'm, gov I'm covered. <laughs> you anyway, that, that, sorry. That, that, a wine shirt out here. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, sorry for that sidetrack there. That's no problem. Yeah. Yeah, so, um, yeah, we, so that sort of thing there, you've, we've got – there's various sort of explanations that it could be. But this, again, um, coming back to these unexplained high speeds. Right. Is there anything else that um, scientifically, with modern, with our, the technology we have at the moment, is there anything we've got that could possibly explain either a natural phenomena? Whether, like you say, bioluminescence and um, almost like a Mexican wave of bacteria doing something and making it look like it's doing yeah. something, but that then wouldn't show up on sonar. Um, and these things, they've been reported to the depths of twenty thousand feet, moving at eighteen hundred kilometers an hour. Now you think, well, is that a shock wave moving through the water from maybe a seismic disturbance or something like that that was picked up? I don't know. Um, but is there any poss possibility that it's um some something which obviously is naturally occurring but we just can't quite figure out at the moment and i mean i must obviously emphasize the unidentified in this at the moment because we're always saying that yeah if it's unidentified it's alien no it's unidentified because we don't know what it is if we knew what right. it is we would then say it's an alien spacecraft underwater or an alien flying object it's not it's unidentified so this is really the yeah. crux of it we still don't know what the hell these things are um we don't we and, don't and right that, that that's that's the major point there really is this unknown part and people hate unknowns so they like to put tags on things and put them into little categories and then say yes it's it must be that then yeah i, I agree with that and i think that when you look at the, the overall nature of what we've seen in the oceans over time okay it's very possible that you know we're seeing something or it's somewhat possible let's put it that way that we're seeing something that's an unknown natural phenomenon but you're gonna have to explain you know how this mexican wave so to speak as you said uh takes place and you know how it can vary in depth and and what animals might be causing that if it's happening and why there's such a concentration of those animals to begin with um, you know, in Shag Harbor, for instance, that's like Nova Scotia. That's very cold water. And yeah. my understanding is that, that bioluminescence occurs in warmer water generally. I could be wrong about that. 
uh, I'm only an astronomer. What do we know? You know, um, yeah. you know, earth science is a big thing. <laughs> yeah. Right. Well, earth science is a big thing. So for us, but I'm telling you the, the problem is we don't know, uh, you know, what, what the population of these animals is anyway in our ocean very well, because it can change for, for, for location. It'd be a lot more say over here in the Caymans and very little over by Britain, a few more over here. I mean, we don't know that the, the concentrations. So again, the ocean is a dark place for the human race. That wasn't supposed to be a rhyme, but it, I guess it was. Um, it, it's a dark place, meaning we don't have a whole lot of information as to why, you know, what's going on in the deep ocean, because we're not there as anything but short-term guests. We don't have a presence there that's permanent. We don't have any kind of way to dive to the deepest parts of the ocean. We don't have any way to understand you know, what even is happening in the deepest parts of the ocean. We're still finding new life forms on every, every one of these biology missions that take off from Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution. There's still new animals being found. Now, we should have that all done, right? Shouldn't we have a full catalog of every creature, every mutation and adaptation that we've seen uh, that evolution is providing? Should we actually have a running tally of that? We don't. Wow. No, no. We have an idea. Yeah. 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 That's it. Yeah. You know? And I mean, this is a thing because the oceans are so, um, they're not impenetrable, but they're, they're a very hostile place, more than a, a, a few dozen meters below. And it's really a, a hostile place for humans and also our machinery. And I mean, uh, the Trieste, which went down to uh, the deepest part of the Marianas Trench. Um, yep, it only the Challenger to, Deep. The Challenger Deep, it only managed to stay there um, about 20 minutes or something like that. Um, That's correct. It wasn't very, very long at all. And they had to come back because the Perspex bubble cracked. Uh, luckily, no. the, it didn't break um, and they managed to make their way back. But that's it. Until James Cameron, the, the, the movie maker, went down there in another version of this, no one else has been down there. Uh, that's it. That's right. know, and it's, that's only, right. it's only seven <clears throat> miles away. Seven miles away, yeah. you could ride your bike in 15 minutes, 20 minutes, and get there. Um, yeah. But to think that uh, we see things at the other side of the universe virtually um, with Hubble and other stuff, and yet we cannot see what seven miles just straight down in the oceans and who yeah. knows what can be down there. And if I was an alien and I wanted to hide and I had the capabilities of making a craft that could travel across, there the, you go. across, across, across the, you go. Uh, the, the, the depths of space and wherever. And if you think, well, if you're that clever to actually be able to do that, then I'm sure you might find a way of actually moving around in water. What better place to hide than in a place where you know that the, the, the locals can't actually find you. <laughs> That's right, and and people in your chat are agreeing, and have even said it before you said it. You know, they're, they're aware. You know, you got a smart group here, Paul. You know, and and the other thing is, you know, when you when you talk about going deep in the ocean, uh, we have a lot of things to overcome, namely the pressure. Uh, just before we got on the air, I actually wrote a program to to, to calculate the pressure. Say, uh, you know, in the Challenger Deep, it's it's over ten thousand pounds per square inch, or you know, if you want to, you know, uh, talk about it in terms of crush depth. Um, at Titanic, it's about 6,800 pounds per square inch. Uh, that's a square inch. And you're used to on your body, 14.7 pounds per square inch. That's a, you know, that's what you're used to. It's 14.69, but who's counting? 14.7 pounds per square inch. That's every square inch of your body, every single place in your body. Okay. From the bottom, from the sides, from the top, that's the pressure of the weight of the air pressing down in your body and pressing you in from all sides. When you're in the water, it's the weight of the water plus the overall column of air all the way to space pressing down in your body. And so that's why uh, it quickly rises when you go down through this dense medium called water. And so uh, if alien beings are here, they would have to know how to uh, manipulate uh, pressure such that it doesn't affect them. I don't think their ships are capable of withstanding the pressure in general. I think that the technology that propels them allows them to withstand that pressure. Okay, that's just a little theory that we have, a lot of us in this community, because we think that maybe they're using a different technology other than moving through the X, Y, and Z uh, dimensions all moving through time, you know, our four dimensions. I think they're using something a little different. Um, and there's a lot of physicists that might actually agree with that, actually. Yeah. Uh, so. It's cool stuff. It, it's it's fascinating. Yeah, actually, you were just saying that um, about if they can travel through 
the depths of the um, the deep oceans where the pressure is so deep, effectively, if you're saying that they could travel um, interdimensionally, then they in theory could travel through solid rock. Maybe. I'm just postulating well, here. I'm not saying anything. <laughs> yeah, no, no, that's a fair question. And, you know, I can't answer that by saying definitely not, because how do yeah, I know? We don't know. <laughs> okay. we, we don't know. But I will say this. The, atom, the atomic structure of rock and the structure of water is very different. Water is <clears throat> in more disorder than a rock structure. A rock is a lattice of molecules of the rock structure as well as, you know, these atoms are arranged in such a way that they can be fairly dense. Water has a pretty much, it's a fairly uniform density that varies very, very tiny amounts across the entire body of the water. Now, there's an old saying, saying that says water is uncompressible or incompressible, okay? Well, that's true for the most part, but water does have some compressibility depending on the density of the water. Uh, you know, or to, it makes the density change rather, the, the compressibility. And that, that small amount is so minimal that you don't even bother to calculate it unless you're really trying to be precise. So uh, I, I think that travel through a water medium, you would not be met with an area of higher density uh, that would potentially be damaging, all right? You'd pretty much be in a uniform density, especially if you're moving horizontally through the water. Uh, you might find different densities as you rose and went down, not because of the depth of the water, but because of the perhaps the temperature and other factors, you know, current flow, little under, underwater current rivers that are moving in the ocean uh, might change some of the density ever so slightly. Maybe that matters, you know, but I don't think it matters uh, overall because they, I think they can travel fairly quickly. I know that, that what they saw, they didn't understand. Uh, and it wasn't any, Navy in the U in the world that could actually handle, uh, you know, or, or create anything of this speed. So we're left puzzling this out. And, you know, if you're watching the stream, hoping for an answer, uh, we don't have an answer. We just have an, a possible solution. You know, we have possible solutions. Once we get our, our, uh, you know, we, we call it UFOTOG2, U-F-O-T-O-G numeral two. Uh, once we get our UFOTOG2 system uh, done for the aerial anomalies, then we're going to focus on the underwater anomalies, as I said. Um, and we're renaming that too to the aerial anomaly detection system, because if you have UFO in the title of anything you're doing, then anyone that has money and wants to fund you runs away. Okay. You got to take UFO out of the title. That's sad, but true, you know, so, but we'll have answers eventually. And I want to find out what's actually going on below the surface of the water. Somewhere, somewhere we will eventually find out at some point. Right, okay then, so I think we'll come on to the questions now. Um, uh, we've got, uh, for, from our Patreons here, Louis Clare. I'd like to know what you think about the infamous Christopher Columbus USO. Now, uh, I must be, like I say, I've not been really privy to these USO things, so I've never really sort of known much about it. So, again, it's going to have to go over to Mark to try and sort of uh, answer that one. I, I can fabricate an answer, but I don't really know much about the Christopher Columbus UFO, and I won't say anything if I don't. Uh, so I, I do apologize for that. Um, I know that USOs are replete throughout our history, and the oldest one, oldest potential one is that one I told you about, the Wanjina legend yeah. uh, from like 5,000 years ago. But I don't doubt that there have been others because uh, this is definitely an ongoing methodology by which, in my mind, uh, any visiting race would – hide in our oceans. It makes perfect sense. Because yeah. if they can travel interstellar, they can certainly go underwater. You and they can figure so, out a yes. way to negate negate that density, that, that, that crushing force. They can negate that. Uh, there's no doubt. Um, yeah. Now, whether, whether it happens or not, I don't know. We can't prove any of the stuff we're talking about, Paul. And that's the kind of the fun part. We can't prove any of this, but um, we only just know what we saw. So, right. okay. Yeah. Okay, then. so we've got second one um, from Kate uh, here. Do you think we, humanity, will ever get a good understanding of the undersea world, both physical and biological, and how long that might take? Um, that's an interesting one because obviously we don't understand that much about it now. I think it's more a case of um, we have other priorities as much as anything, uh, and we're more interested in what's going on outside the planet rather than what's going on right under our noses, I think. Well, that, that, that is sort of true, I think. I mean, 
I, I could, I'd side with you on that 100%, except for the fact that I believe that you know, we're, as a human race, we're actually becoming better stewards of the planet, believe it or not. Um, and uh, when there was the, remember the BP oil spill some years back? Uh, yes. Yes. The, the British petroleum oil spill in the Gulf. Uh, several hundred million gallons of, of oil were leaking out. And I started, I noticed uh, what looked like an impropriety on the uh, submersible feeds because I was glued to them. I had a whole bunch of screens with all these feeds going on every day, all day long, just to watch them. And uh, I made note of this impropriety. And when I made it public, I got a call from the CEO of a major oil company. And he talked to me about what they were doing in the Gulf and why it was so important for them to keep it clean. Uh, and I actually, you know... I, I was a guy thinking, you know, big oil is killing our planet. But on the other hand, after I talked to him, because he called me every single day with a status update. He says, have you seen the submersible feeds today? I want to show you what we're doing. I wasn't anybody. I'm not like the New York Times or anything like that. But he was a concerned guy. And, and I got a feeling from him. And when I looked at his background, he's an ecologist. He's an environmentalist. He wants to extract the oil. Yes. Okay, so we must we so we can continue to burn burn dead things for fuel, which is already a you know a, a losing proposition if you think about mm -hmm. it. Um, but he was very uh, he was very <laughs> adamant. He was very adamant about the fact that you know they want to do what's right for the for the Gulf, and he said his scientists were telling him that there was not going to be any uh, long uh, long term uh, destruction of the Gulf that was, would not be replaceable. Um, it turned out that he was partially correct. And it had to do with the blooming algae that, that uh, came to life, so to speak, and ate up all the methane that was floating around in the water that could have made dead zones. That, I think, shows you that the planet does manage to uh, take care of itself. But people don't understand, for instance, that the planet has these natural seeps of oil. During the, during the year, we get billions of tons of oil that seep into the ocean because of cracks in the ocean floor. You know, yeah, And natural oil is, is coming in. Yeah, we See? dig it out, so, and it must come out by itself at some point. In fish it does, or and it cracks, does. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And if the Earth wasn't capable of cleaning it up, for instance, then we'd have an oily film on our oceans now, everywhere. Yes. See, so, uh, so the point is, we're going to learn more about our ocean floor. We're going to learn about how to take better care of ourselves and our planet. And we already do have good bathymetry, that is the bottom analysis that shows us the slopes and everywhere where there's rocks and, and, and canyons and stuff. We have good bathymetry for the ocean now, and, uh, but there is, there is missing data. And you know, to get a kind of a rudimentary look at it, if you go to Google Earth and turn off the ocean so you don't see the, 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 the ocean shimmering, you see the bottom terrain. That's actually fairly accurate, uh, and, but there are some mistakes. There's errors in the data. Like off Malibu, there there seems to be like this plateau which drops to a cliff. It looks like it has columns, okay? And this, just because of the Google Earth error of mapping that, uh, people thought this was a secret UFO base underwater. And that became a big thing that was uh, went through a, a number of uh, UFO television shows. I knew what it was because I understood how the data was acquired, and I knew that there was errors in the data. But that's okay. Uh, I'm only one voice in a sea of, of other people that are conspiracy hounds, which is fine. Uh, we need everybody. Uh, so, you know, we're becoming better stewards and our, our planet is, is becoming better for it. You know, we're, you know, I know that there's people that will not agree with that hundred percent, but think about the long term. over the long term, we're doing better. Our graph is going up, not down. Okay. And, and it's not level either. It's actually going up a little bit. We're, we're doing better than we have ever done. In fact. Yeah. Yeah, I'd, I'd, with I'd the plan. Yeah. yeah, I think we'd have to agree that we are finally sort of getting a handle on things with things like plastics. I mean, like today, the British yes. government is actually talking about uh, banning uh, the sale of disposable plastics by X, Y, Z time. So there's something that is actually sort of happening now. People are becoming aware of that now. Um, obviously, so that doesn't necessarily translate to exactly the question which we've just been asked uh how long it will take to understand the undersea world i think when i didn't we answer that you're right yeah finally when we actually um understand its importance and we're starting to i think we'll put a lot more resources <clears throat> into it but uh, um again i think it's just down to um the interested part of parties which have the abilities um really sort of um getting off their backsides and doing something um, and just not sort of saying, oh, well, it doesn't really matter. The sea, the sea can sort itself out um, because obviously if we pump in enough 
toxins, um, it won't. Um, but anyway, right. So uh, next one, what have we got here? Um, uh, Marco Krajulak. Uh, sorry if I can't pronounce your name there. It sounds like it's Polish, maybe. Um, uh, can you ask Mark if he remembers which direction these objects were moving in? I presume were they moving towards the ship, uh, towards the submarine, away, but in parallel? Um, actually, in chat, I actually answered his question, but um, I, I, I didn't answer that for everybody who's listening, of course, so I will. Uh, I had no idea because I, I couldn't tell, because uh, I couldn't read the, 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 the waterfall display that was showing the sonar traces, uh, and... I couldn't hear. Uh, I couldn't hear when the executive officer asked him, you know, bearing in range. The kid said it, but I couldn't hear it. I was really at the edge of my seat, literally on the edge of my seat, uh, and I heard nothing but the speed. When he said the speed, he said it loud because he was sort of incredulous about it. The kid did. He's like several hundred knots, sir, and he just looked at the EXO like, uh, "What do I do with this?" You know, and that's when the EXO said, "Can you confirm it?" Looked at the other sonar, and then said, "All right, log it and dog it." And it's like, wow. I was just blown away because uh, primarily because I knew I wasn't going to die <laughs> from a torpedo. I was actually, you know, uh, going to live through this, you know, which is good. But anyway, um, I don't know the bearing and, and, or the range. I couldn't hear uh, that part of it, but he had some data on that, obviously. Yeah. I didn't actually, get to hear it. Re it relates to the next question, which is, uh, I wonder how long the sonar operator tracked the anomaly for, for how long? Was it a second, 10 seconds, 20 seconds, minute? Well, it, take, it takes time for those um, for a sonar uh, track to uh, resolve and, and show up. So it takes uh, it takes time. So it as this thing is going down, you're, you're, you're at, it builds the sonar track, and then you can get a better solution on where the thing is as it, as it goes longer. As I understand it, um, my total involvement with this was probably about I'd say four minutes, maybe five at the most. Uh, and I don't know whether he continued to track it after. Um, when I went back, uh, I, I couldn't tell what I was looking at on the screen. It, it might have been something like that, but uh, it might have been a little bit longer. Um, but I, I couldn't tell the, the duration of the time. And that's a very, very good question. So whoever asked that, you get a gold star because <laughs> that's a very important question. Yeah. yeah, so so obviously it takes a certain amount of time for the actual equipment to uh, pick it up and then resolve it and then track it. So it was there for a, a good few minutes then. Uh, that's what I would say. And, and uh, the equipment hears things right away. But just because you hear a sound, you have to let it develop so you can tell its course and its bearing, how, where, where, where you can tell where it's coming from. That's the initial sound. But if you want to figure out how fast it's moving, you got to let it develop. You yes. got to let the track develop over time, and then you can do a time versus distance, uh, you yeah, know, calculation just, basically, yeah. and then figure out how far away it is. And that's that's I think what they were doing. And uh, the longer they waited, the better they'd get for speed. But you know, they they waited several, a uh, couple minutes, I would say, a few minutes. I can't remember directly. Uh, and then they managed to get a speed for it that they came to the conclusion of several hundred knots. Now, why he didn't say? Uh, four hundred and twenty-seven point three knots. Why he didn't give an exact number is a mystery to me. I yeah. think maybe it was sort of a knee-jerk reaction because he couldn't believe his own his own calculation or something. I don't know. He said several hundred knots, you know. And then the XO didn't say, "Well, clarify that. How fast exactly?" He didn't say that. He just said, "All right." Once he knew it was several hundred knots, that changed the the uh, the discussion altogether. Apparently, um, as so if I don't they'd know. actually seen it before and they they knew what to do. It seemed that the kid never saw that before. I don't know but the, for but sure. The, the XO might have done. He seemed like he knew what to do with it. Uh, whether yeah. he'd seen one before or not, he knew what to do with it once he knew what it wasn't. It wasn't a Russian. It wasn't Chinese. Okay, it's one of those things. Lock it away. You right. know, and we'll give it to the guys down in Washington. Let them worry about it. That's what I think right. I was getting out of this. Yeah. Okay, we've got Seafox011. Uh, what depth would you say were you, and how close to the shore, if you knew? Well, obviously, you can't look out the window, because <laughs> there isn't any. <laughs> <laughs> well, again, I was in the sonar area, so I wasn't at the con, so I couldn't actually ask anyone how deep we were. I just know that it felt like we were stable for quite a long time. 
maybe an hour, two hours or whatever, meaning that we're down however far. You don't feel yourself diving because the boat doesn't go like this and say, oh, we're leaning forward. It doesn't, it just, it, it goes like this. It, it basically settles down and comes up generally, you know, only when they do that emergency blow, like you see on TV where it comes out, okay, that you feel because the boat comes up and lurches and bounces on the surface of the water. But usually you're just diving like this. You just sort of sink out of sight and go down like this really, really slowly. Uh, and by the time you're at depth, you don't even know how deep you are. Uh, no, and there's no, no way to know. Yeah. I should imagine it's so quite, I don't know. Yeah. I mean, I've obviously never been in a submarine, but I can imagine it can be quite sort of um, difficult to work. It's like being in a plane when they're doing a shallow bank around and you can't really tell or feel uh, yourself without having some sort of frame of reference, like you were saying when you're on the surface and it was wobbling from side to side. But yeah, you, you can't really sort of tell any more from that without having um, some sort of gauge saying you are X number of meters deep and you're in this heading and you're so far, or you had a map saying you where you were. And of course, obviously, you're not going to see that sort of thing or, or an external reference, like looking yeah. out the window. OK, yeah. and, and you're right. And, you know, I mean, when I, I flew with the Army's skydiving team to photograph them and. I was in the open door of the aircraft at 12,000 feet and they were jumping out. And then when the, when they jumped out, the plane went up on its side and did a steep turn and came around and landed, uh, landed before the first jumper hit the ground. That was their whole thing. Why do I mention that? I mentioned that because it was a reference frame thing inside the plane. If you didn't look out the door, all you felt was heavier. You didn't see yeah. that the plane was on its side. You didn't see any of that. You just felt the downward force pushing you into your seat. Okay. And then when you look out the window and you saw a blue sky up to your right and the runway out the window to your left, okay, uh, that was a little unnerving, I have to say. But uh, that, that is the only way you knew that. So we don't have that in the sub. You don't have that external reference. You just know that you're inside this, this, this cylindrical tube, you know, and, uh, and, and you, you don't have any references whatsoever. You only have your instruments and your sonar is the only eyes that you have on a sub. Yeah, yeah, right. Obvious. Yeah. I mean, uh, um, so so really, uh, you you don't know other than your gauges are telling you. But uh, that, right, that's, I think, that's right. Yeah, I think we've actually come to the end of our questions now. So, and actually, we were trying to wrap it up uh, uh, for an hour. We're just coming up to an hour now, so I think it's probably a good time to actually um, bring it to a close now. I'd like to thank everybody um in the chat for the questions and obviously hanging on in with us and um, obviously our patreon members um uh for all our their support and obviously um i might have a little thing coming up somewhere here saying you can now click on the link now which i might add on later um but we've got uh, to say thank you very much to mark um for coming on and explaining what he experienced and uh where can we find you mark we can find you at uh Sky Tours um, uh, uh, live stream yeah. uh, on YouTube. Yes, Sky uh, Tour, Sky Tour live stream with Mark D'Antonio on YouTube. Subscribe, come on in, have fun. Uh, my website is www.fxmodels.com. That's F is in Frank, X is in X-ray. Models, M-O-D-E-L-S. dot com. Uh, that's my company, and uh, you can come visit us there. Uh, and if you have UFOs or other cases you'd like to have examined, you can go to Mufon. dot com. And have uh, have them contact me from there, which they'll do, because I'm their chief photo and video analyst. And I just want to say one thing, though, Paul, re re really fast. I don't benefit from talking about this stuff. All right. Uh, if anything, it can hurt my career. Um, but I, I talk about it only because you can't make up these things. And when this happens, it really does change you. So you know, you get to the point where you say, I, I got to just talk about this. And until the Russians came out and started talking about these happening with their subs that's when I felt it would be more comfortable for me to come out and talk about it. So, uh, you know, if for those that, you know, think um, I'm, this is all baloney or whatever, I don't know what to tell you. I didn't need to do this. You know, I didn't need to say this uh, and it, it doesn't necessarily help me to say it, but I just want to tell everyone listening that I'm telling you this because, you know, don't, don't take my word for this. Go look for yourself, do the research. This stuff is out there. You can find this other uh, in other places, not just in, tabloid reading okay if this is all real and uh you know as a science guy i don't know how to deal with it frankly um and it hurts my science to have to deal with it publicly so uh it's not easy right there. right well obviously 
we're very grateful for you two coming on and explaining, even if, like you say, it might have a negative connotation um, in the scientific uh, circles which you you work in. And obviously, uh, being a, a US Navy contractor, it could have implications at some point with your actual paid work. So um, fair play to you for actually sort of having the balls to come out and do it, basically. Um, I think that would be the, the simple answer for I can say. Yeah, I, I, <laughs> yeah, and they probably got a little bit smaller after I got involved <laughs> and started getting out there because, you know, I, I was always asking, you know, what did I do? I mean, maybe I should have just kept it quiet. But then I realized yeah, the people that are keeping it quiet – they're, they're, they're hurting, furthering our knowledge here, you know. I'm not trying to say something's out there that isn't. I'm trying to say there's something out there that we don't understand. Now, whether it's, you know, extraterrestrial beings in our water or not, I don't know. And in fact, I'm not saying that's what it is. I'm saying it's a phenomenon that we don't understand. But I think given time and the proper instrumentation and study, we can figure this out, you know. And I don't care who does it. I'm not looking to get a cash payment from this, okay. I I'm, I'm just want to see it done. I don't care who does it. I don't benefit from it at all, actually. Yeah. I so. think at some point we will eventually find out what is actually going on, but whether that means there's going to be a radical change in government policy and much more openness, and uh, you can't quite see that happening any time soon. So. But that's it. Um, so anyway, uh, thank you very much there, Mark, for uh, coming on. And I'd just like to say thank you very much for everyone for hanging on in there. And also don't forget to have a look at some of our other videos which are online uh, that you may find interesting. Oh, not necessarily, we haven't actually touched on much of the way of the UFO, USO, certainly USO things before. But obviously the Cold War technologies and that sort of thing, we've got quite a few videos on that sort of thing there. So thank you very much for uh, watching. And I'd just like to say um, that please subscribe thumbs up and share.